<coughs> Hello, now we'll talk about Toyo Ito, also born on uh, June 1st. And today is June 1st, 2023. And he was born on the same day with um, uh, Sir Norman Foster and um, uh, Rafael Vignoli. But let's, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, contemplate the works of this uh, Japanese architect who was actually born in South Korea, in Seoul but from Japanese uh, parents. Uh, interesting um, eyeglasses, but architects uh, do have a problem, I think, with eyeglasses. I don't know why it is so. Uh, Le Corbusier chose a distinctive uh, uh, you know, pair of glasses. And since then, other architects either mimicked him, uh, even uh, Greg Pasquarelli from Shop masqueraded himself with uh, some glasses uh, kind of inspired by Le Corbusier. Even Stephen Hall sported some strange uh, eyeglasses, I mean the frames. And uh, of course, Philip Johnson, and now we see Toyo Ito. What is it about architects? I mean, you know, we are talking about uh, very important architects. Why can't they choose, uh, you know, uh, less... Uh, a strident or uh, you know exotic uh, pair of glasses. You know why, why? Why do glasses have to be so awkward in a way? Because even these, I think, they are awkward in my opinion. A little bit awkward. Anyway, Toyo Ito, <clears throat> born June first, nineteen forty-one, is a Japanese architect known for creating conceptual architecture in which he seeks to simultaneously express the physical and virtual worlds. He is a leading, well, this is simplistic and even wrongly put, but that's what I took from Wikipedia. He is a leading exponent of architecture that addresses the contemporary notion of a simulated city and has been called one of the world's most innovative and influential architects. In 2013, so 10 years ago, Ito was awarded the Pritzker Prize, one of architecture's most prestigious prizes. He was a likely front runner for the Pritzker Prize for the previous 10 years. A recent trend has seen less experienced and well-known winners. For example, Chinese architect Wang Shu in 2012, and the award to Toyo Ito is seen as recognition of a lifetime's achievement in architecture. So he is actually 82 years old now. As we can see, he loves books. There are plenty of books there, but he has a very modest um, architecture office. And I like this. I like the modesty of his, um, of his office uh, very much. But uh, I don't know what to think about this shirt. Maybe it is Japanese in a way, uh, but... Um, uh, that uh, pink, uh, you know, constellation of, um, you know, spots on the white shirt uh, is a little bit uh, exotic, let's put it this way. But he looks boyish. He's probably 70 years old here, if not more. And this is the Pritzker. Now we look at it, and uh, is this an approximation of the eyes of, a, of an owl? Uh, you know, uh, the, the wisdom bird, or uh, I don't know. Anyway, the Pritzker Architecture Prize. Let's look at it and let's desire it. And now we see here, uh, you know, uh, some of the happy ones. Uh, the first one on the top uh, corner is uh, Fry Otto, about whom we talked uh, the other day, and then Sir Norman Poster, and then... Uh, uh, <laughs> The, I almost said the sorry. I know it's totally inappropriate the way I feel like talking. Uh, you know, I almost felt like saying no, no, I shouldn't say it. But I did think of saying the two Swiss criminals. Of course, they are not. Although Jacques Herzog does look a little bit um, uh, ready to tempt such words. And then Zaha Hadid, Dame Zaha Hadid, and then Richard Meyer, the you know, the molester of younger women in his office, and then the mystic, 
so-called mystic Peter Zumthor and then, um, you know, the subdued, uh, more reticent, but with an ironical, or I don't know, a whimsical smile on his face, Robert Venturi, and then Oscar Niemeyer, who went beyond the age of 100, I think he died in 102, and then Kazuyo Sejima and, and her partner, and unfortunately I will die before memorizing his name, and then the carpenter and bus uh, truck driver and um, boxer uh, and Pritzker Prize laureate Adao Ando, and then Sir Richard Rogers, a former partner of um, and friend of uh, Sir Norman Foster, and then Jean Nouvel, and then Frank Gehry at the bottom in the lower corner, who will probably uh, leave, I would leave uh, Oscar Niemeyer. And then I don't know that architect. Uh, that's the only one I don't recognize on this list. I think he's from Australia. Uh, there are others that are missing here, like Hans Hollein and others. And then uh, James Sterling, uh, before I am paying, uh, continuously happy and continuously smiling. Uh, anyway, here he is, Toyo Ito, uh, receiving the Pritzker. And here he doesn't look so happy. I know he had the suffering in his life. Uh, his wife died and I think he suffered a lot when, when he lost her. Toyoito, 2013, the Pritzker. With a Pritzker family member on the left. The glory of success, the appeal of success, the seductions of gold and money and success. The self-styled dissatisfied architect born in Seoul. I like this. I think we need more dissatisfied architects. Now, after you know, Sir Norman Foster, we could welcome a change. Although maybe, maybe Sir Norman Foster knew some dissatisfaction too, but his architecture doesn't show it. Okay, Toyo Ito finds inspiration in air, wind, and water. Where is fire? Air, wind, water. It's a tower that he built, uh, but I, I will show you later, I hope. Uh, but now I show a, a dwelling for a Tokyo nomad woman. And when I attended uh, his conference in New York City at the Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture and Urban Planning, after I attended his conference where he presented actually this dwelling for a Tokyo nomad woman and what could be more said than a nomad woman. Uh, I wrote a reply uh, apropos of uh, Toyo Ito's uh, lecture and if you are interested, I could send it to you. It was uh, like, like an experiment, experimental house that he imagined for a nomad woman in Tokyo. Now, I wonder why he thought of this. But as we read, uh, described in Wikipedia, he is considered a conceptual architect, but he built a lot. In my opinion, you know, any good architecture is to an extent at least what is called conceptual. So a dwelling for a nomad woman in Tokyo, meaning a lonely woman. But in the past, the woman was the repository of stability. That's why we say Mother Earth. She, she, she couldn't be a nomad under normal conditions, but in the present, you know, a destabilized earth, the woman probably could uh, take her luggage and uh, leave stability behind. And in that context, perhaps, you know, this work by Toyo Ito has some relevance. But all in all, it's something sad about a nomadic woman, you know. 
maybe a woman who gave up even the idea of uh, having a family and thus a home. This is from a media center, a media tech, an important work by him. I hope I come back and I shouldn't, uh, I should not have had this image here. Back to the nomadic uh, house. Uh, not nomadic house. But now she, he, he analyzed, so to speak, and expressed architecturally also the idea of a nomadic restaurant, the restaurant nomad in Tokyo. Um, so again, Toyo Ito was, uh, is, is a complex uh, archi architect uh, who assumes, uh, uh, you know, even a, a critical position vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, uh, you know, uh, Tokyo or urban life in general. Uh, so I would say that his mind is like an umbrella, open to refer to the words of Walter Gropius. Tiny houses, again, for nomads, Toyo Ito. And the preoccupation with small houses uh, is shown also in the work he exhibited at the Venice Biennial, and I think they received the Golden Lion in that year, not too many years ago. I will show some works uh, from, from the Venice Biennial that he did, but different kind of houses than, than the ones you see here. I don't know who commissioned him for these works. Now, the Tower of Winds, you remember, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I read about it, but there were no images. Now you can see it. I don't know what, what is the function of this tower. Indeed, he could be a dissatisfied architect, even if he had what we call success. But then we can talk, what is success? Uh, it is even more remarkable that an architect with his level of accomplishments uh, still uh, is visited by what we call dissatisfaction. So the, the tower is not, it's a, it's not based on the circle, but based on the ellipse. Uh, first image, uh, first images might might have made you think it's 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 a cylinder with a square uh, plan uh, with a uh, round uh, uh, with a circle as a plan. It's an ellipse, and this changes uh, uh, perceptions and then ch changes the impressions that one could have in its proximity. Is it a small Baroque gesture because the Baroque architects loved uh, the, the ellipse? Maybe to an extent, although the language is uh, thoroughly modern and almost minimalistic. Serpentine Gallery Pavilion in 2002, so 21 years ago in London. I like this building. So you see, he doesn't have a signature way of doing architecture. Um, what is the, the formal connection between this building and the tower we just saw? There isn't. But look at the interior. It's um, fragmented, you know, with uh, some kind of, a, you know, formal or graphic neurosis. Because, yes, it was built in, in this century. Uh, and... Uh, Maybe it expresses something, the dynamics, even the psychological dy dynamics of our time. Now, how is the structure here? Where is that uh, predictable structure that one can find in, uh, let's say, some of the buildings, maybe a good part of the buildings by, let's say, Sir Norman Foster, who goes birthdays also today. This is something which, Norman Foster would have never done. And in a way, I admire Norman Foster for, for, for not uh, being seduced by the you know, fluctuations of fashion in architecture. He was untouched by postmodernism and untouched by deconstructivism. And I actually think this is a, a, a positive attribute of Sir Norman Foster and his architecture.
On the other hand, he, he never arrived at the intriguing architectures like Toyo Ito was able to generate, like this building, for example, the Serpentine Pavilion uh, in London. They built another one in Japan, similar, probably around that time, and we are going to see it. We see, what do we see here? We see an exoskeleton, which is both structural and ornamental. Even if, like I said before, kind of a neurotical ornamentation. But the structure becomes ornament and the ornament becomes structure. And the roof becomes wall, the ceiling becomes wall, and maybe even the, the floor becomes walls and roofs somehow at the level of, you know, form. Not so, you know, explicitly and radically like the Prada pavilion that uh, Rem Kolhas built in, uh, in Seoul, in South Korea. But still, anyway, I, I think it's a good building by uh, Toyo Ito, this one, which would infuriate the uh, modest, uh, not aspiring uh, structuralists of this world. I'm talking about engineers and architects who would not accept a building to be built in this way because they only like vertical, uh, uh, you know, uh, columns and the horizontal beams, and that's it. Probably, you know, equidistant, of course. The Sumika Pavilion, this is the other pavilion that he built in, in Japan, similar to this building. And here it is. And it's not in London any longer, but in Japan. And we see here the disarray of a structure, if I am to call it disarray of a structure that is uh, still aspiring towards some kind of a forest of columns, if we are to refer to the Gothic cathedral. You know, there are here some, uh, in the movement of these uh, wooden elements, um, I guess some kind of a longing for an order which is not possible easily today. But also a quest for embroidery, architectural embroidery. Because what else do we see there on the floor, on the on the roof? It's an embroidered roof. The excitement of erecting a building which is, uh, you know, a surprising, unexpected, unique, where you experiment, I think is a legitimate excitement. And an excitement should, uh, that should uh, visit other architects as well, if they take risks, of course, because if they don't, they are not going to have that excitement. Maybe here there is also an expression of a desire for weaving, you know, uh, for a spider's work.
he designed also these wooden benches, which are not so simple or simplistic as they might appear. I hope I have another image so we can see there are depressions in the wooden surface where the circles are or the fragmented circles. You can see a little bit here. So maybe Robert Venturi himself, a recipient of the Pritzker Prize, would have been uh, rather happy because he thought that uh, less is a bore. Well, here we don't have too much lessness. The structure of the building. I wish there were some uh, orthodox um, engineers here to see that it's possible to build a structure very differently from what they imagine. Not bad. Sendai Mediatek, this is a very important uh, work in, in his oeuvre. Uh, you know, at the first sight, the, uh, from the outside, you do not notice the structure of the building, which is uh, uh, unique. And you'll understand why, because the, the, the vertical elements of the structure are actually not, not totally vertical, and uh, meaning not perpendicular on the slabs, and they actually at the core empty. This is very unique. They actually kind of like uh, uh, you know uh, deformed uh, cylinders of various diameters uh, that seem to struggle towards uh, moving upwards. A very interesting uh, conception, and it was it was built. And you see here in the in the in this section through the Mediatek. So obviously Toyo Ito had and has a, a more uh, elastic and even uh, troubled and troublesome uh, or troubling uh, conception about structure. He is not so convinced that, archite that uh, architecture can, uh, you know, get rid of ornament and can get rid even of uh, some uh, doubting, you know, just by promoting uh, um, a serene but demagogically serene uh, structure. This, are, this is a structure that seems to uh, um, flirt a little bit with the organic and with the world of uh, doubting, with hesitations. Uh, how do you build a structure that is hesitant? I think it would be interesting if you can do it. The building still stands, but the, the vertical elements that sustain, support the, the building is, uh, is rather hesitant. Maybe I could call them uh, Hamletian columns. And they are not even columns, they are tubes. Uh, you see them well here. In itself, this vertical structural element is an architectural event, not devoid of uh, ornamental tendencies. This reminds me, this picture reminds me a little bit of some towers in the, in the estate of Hansel, Anselm Kiefer, the famous uh, German uh, artist. And maybe uh, towers built or conceived in this way express some doubting, some pessimism even, 
Although the Mediatek is not a pessimistic function and it's not a pessimistic building. But maybe you could understand a little bit, not just the expression of the face of Toyo Ito in some pictures, but also as being uh, described as a dissatisfied architect. Interesting work. And the plan is very Japanese. It reminds one uh, a little also of some works by Kazuya Sejima and her partner. I have to learn his 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 name really. I'm I'm ashamed of myself that, that I, I cannot memorize his name. Toyo Ito. So he actually replaced one column with a tower of columns. Todd's Omotesando building. I understood that this street or this avenue in Tokyo is um, famous for its trees. Apparently, there aren't too many avenues like this in the great city that are animated by uh, uh, you know, impressive trees. And I guess he was inspired by the trees to create again this uh, exoskeleton, which is both structure and ornament. Uh, he also welcomes disorder, or rather the spontaneous order of nature, which might appear to be disordered, but is not actually disordered. Uh, the aleatory movement of nature is welcomed by this architect, and I think he should be appreciated for this. It's very possible this tree in front of the building found in the building a friend, if not a relative, as opposed to a blank adversary. Not bad. It's a commercial building. It's not, uh, you know, a temple or a church or anything. It's a commercial building, but he made architecture possible for this uh, commercial building, some kind of a store, you know, a big vertical store, but it's a store. It's about selling and buying. But he still, he still says something architecturally through this building. Mikimoto Ginza too in Tokyo, another tower. This reminds one of that photograph we saw of him with that white shirt and those pink uh, spots. Again, here he plays with the windows, uh, you know, at, at his whim. So again, the structure becomes ornament and the ornament becomes structure. In a conventional sense, structure disappeared. Here is, uh, I think this building he built in Barcelona or in Paris, I'm not, I regret, uh, I forgot, either in Barcelona or in Paris, it's not in, uh, in, in Japan, it's not in Tokyo. 
a very a very good uh, public theater building in uh, in Japan is this black one you know uh, uh, i think even if you didn't know it's a theater you might have thought it is a theater because in its essence a theater is a black box uh, this one has the you know the the engaging geometry and the fragile little openings if we had to call them windows they are not really windows uh, you see here this uh, you know uh, constellation of round little uh, openings i don't know what their function is i don't know if they are windows or what impeccably executed we are in japan playful a little bit ominous because of its blackness but certainly a creative building and yes it is a theater even if it's not written on it i am a theater or what else could it be Maybe there are also some echoes from, because he is, a, after all, an educated architect from Hans Scharun's Philharmonia in Berlin. Ito Museum of Architecture in Imabari on the island of Omishima. Uh, now, I never knew exactly if this is a museum of architecture in general or is a museum of his architecture on an island, but in both cases, it is impressive that there are several structures, several pavilions, several buildings dedicated to architecture. Yeah, he plays with the hexagon in a rather explicit way, but the out, out, outdoor, the out, outer uh, image of the building uh, is not so, you know, predictable in a way as the plan. Uh, what is here? I don't know why I included this picture here. Anyway, look at uh, you know the, the playfulness of um, you know uh, working with these uh, polyeders and uh, you know assembling them, disassembling them. Uh, you know there is there is a, a you know a homo ludens in uh, in Toyoito, obviously. But there are all kinds of buildings. You can see the one on the right is also built by him, which is a little bit different from that, uh, you know, uh, large fragment of the endless column by Brunkush. It might be that uh, this whole uh, museum of architecture is actually about his architecture because we see here the model of that uh, building in Tokyo that we just saw. So all these buildings are by him on this island. It's incredible in a way because Japan was a country devastated by tsunamis, earthquakes, you know, uh, a nuclear disaster. But when you look at these images and this museum and the, the, its very function, 
the you know the clear skies, the clear water. It's, it's, it's as if this country never knew you know drama or tragedy or the bombings of uh, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. A remarkable people, actually. How they transcended, actually, and even, uh, yeah, they, 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 the tragedy is not allowed to uh, make uh, children, so to speak. It's, it's, um, it's conquered by men through a lot of work, of course, and inspiration and generosity. even built a museum for uh, artworks about the mother and the child. I hope I have here, you know, dedicated only to, uh, to works, artworks celebrating uh, motherhood. Uh, in my essay, I talked about how is, uh, this is what he wrote, Toyo uh, Ito. In my, um, in my, um, in my essay, I talked about uh, how a human being has two bodies. One is the physical body. We used to drink water, wake up, and so on, perform very primitive actions, while the other body is, uh, what, is what I call the subconscious body, which is our soul. Architecture today really needs to stimulate and work around both bodies. Actually, my architecture is still focused on that. I feel it can never be one or the other body. There needs to be an harmony between the bodies, the two bodies, and how that harmony is reflected in architecture is one of my biggest focus. Very interesting. So like uh, Stephen Hall, who didn't yet receive the Pritzker, but he deserves it, uh, Toyo Ito also values the so-called the other body, the subconscious body, meaning the soul. And not too many architects talk about the soul. And not too many architects try to honor the soul with, a, 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 you know, an, an, adequate, uh, an, an adequate architecture. Unfortunately, now I cannot move forward. I don't know why. And it's embarrassing, but... Just a second, please bear with me. I have troubles with this tab. I move it around and, and, the, and, the, and the arrows that, that move forward, the pages do not show up. So I, I cannot move forward the, the presentation. Uh, I don't know what to do. It's, it's incredible. They don't show up. Those arrows do not show up and I cannot move forward. From the audience, if any of you has a suggestion what to do, please let me know because I, I, I'm embarrassed and uh, I don't know what to do. Usually the round, the left at the bottom, arrows showing, uh, you know, moving forward, uh, finally something, okay, something worked. This is the museum I, I, I talked about, the Ken Iwata Mother and Child Museum in Japan. So only artworks about mother and child, about motherhood. An interesting idea and I think a worthy idea. I think I have here also a picture with him visiting his own, uh, his own building. Yes, here he is. The Mother and Child Museum, Toyo Ito, Japan. Here he is again.
a very moving theme, of course. I wish there were more museums with this theme in the world. Taiwan Solar Stadium can deliver, look, a stadium. But this part of the stadium is very dramatic. And why shouldn't architecture be dramatic? Not all the building is like this. I, this picture is the most uh, rhetorical, but it's important that, that that such a picture can be taken. And uh, you see the structure is uh, joyously contorted. He built also something in Spain, uh, which was uh, abandoned. And uh, I think, uh, I hope I have pictures of that. Uh, also somehow similar to, to, to this, a smaller structure and for some reason was not um, finalized the work and abandoned and maybe even vandalized. This is a good work in Barcelona. There are two towers, a hotel and some kind of uh, office housing, I think. This is the hotel on the left, a reddish one. But he built both. Both towers in Barcelona are by Toyo Ito. Not bad. And not bad at all. Architecture is not only about the reason and it's not only about justifications and it's not only about objectivity, it's also about subjectivity and even capriciousness. I mean, here there are some um, architectonic decisions that he took, which uh, are subjective in their nature, but it's nothing wrong. Quite the opposite. It is that this very subjectivity that gives uh, architectonic quality and interest to the buildings. Why was he invited to build in Barcelona? I mean, Barcelona has its own good architects. Well, because he deserves it, that's why. Barcelona thought that uh, it could gain something from uh, Toyo Ito. And indeed, this red tower, look at its uh, skin. In a certain way, Toyo Ito is the opposite architect of um, Sir Norman Foster. Sir Norman Foster has 1,500 employees Toyo Ito probably has no more than 20. And in a very modest, um, you know, studio, uh, I wish I had pictures of it here. But, but the work, in my opinion, is actually more interesting than the work of the big um, architectural um, factory uh, run by Sir Norman Foster, with all due respect. There is quality, of course, in the works of uh, Sir Norman Foster. But here, exactly because of the hesitations and the complexity of the work of Toyo Ito and his concern with two bodies, the physical and the psychic or the soul, this shows in the work. And if there are fluidities, the fluidities are not so predictable and even commercial or mundane as, as those of, let's say, med architects and others. They are more complex.
Hotel Porta Fira, Toyo Ito, Barcelona. Well, from the web. Taichung, Taichung Metropolitan Opera House, Taiwan. This was a work that took some years to come into being. There is a level of artificiality and even uh, to an extent uh, questionable organicity. But again, it's not a building you can ignore. I'm not so convinced about all that large uh, glass surface, nor uh, about this the rather almost pop facade. But there are intricacies here, those uh, erosions, those uh, tentacles of the outside that uh, attack the inside. Uh, I think he worked on this building with, uh, with Andrea Brazzi, an interesting Italian architect designer. The glasswork uh, kind of dissatisfies me, but I mean the windows, these large windows. But the interior, which uh, simulates, uh, you know, some kind of a man-made cave, um, is uh, it's interesting. It's engaging. It's provocative. One thing is for sure, the building of this building was an adventure uh, for the architect, for the even for the client, for the, for the builders, and it pays off. A collective adventure, if you want. There was struggle, no, but. Part of the excitement maybe derives from the struggle. An expensive struggle indeed, not very sustainable, I would say, but uh, at that time, but, but, but if we betray sustainability, if we, uh, you know, do not honor it uh, sufficiently, at least to build an interesting building, you know, but, but to betray sustainability for the sake of building another banal building that throws a shadow, an unworthy shadow on the earth, that's unacceptable. But if you build a building, okay, we sacrifice, we sacrifice things, you know. Uh, I'm not totally sure that, uh, you know, the certificate of uh, uh, not guilty should, should still be given but at least you did it with a reason. You created something, something new, something uh, not seen before, something that, uh, you know, it's, it is a creation. And in, 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 look here, the structure of this building, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's sustaining itself through this uh, um, interlocking uh, you know, uh, tubes of large dimensions, which are both vertical structure and horizontal structure. It, it's an organism. Maybe too artificially exposed towards the outside, but it's still uh, unique.
La Racacola, this is the building in Spain that was abandoned, the snail, and I regret it was. I don't know exactly what its function was supposed to be, the snail. The museum in Mexico dedicated to Baroque art, Mexican Baroque art, in my opinion, too white. The Baroque spirit deserves something else, in my opinion. Maybe even more so in Mexico. It's, it's, this excessive whiteness is a little bit um, not doing justice to the Baroque art, and especially in that part of the world. Perhaps. I don't know why he made it so whitish. So white, actually. Maybe some, some kind of opposition to the exuberance and the hotness of the Mexican spirit, maybe, but I don't think that was necessary. Also, here we see these, uh, you know, common. Uh, poles or columns is still, you know, this, um, yeah, this, this is a, a building, in my opinion, a little bit, not quite Toyo Ito. Mason Omori Municipal Funeral Hall, also white, uh, and it's a funeral hall, but here whiteness could also assume, uh, you know, the, the function of, uh, you know, some kind of a, a, a absoluteness that uh, is connected with what we call domus eterna, you know, the, the house of the dead. And maybe in Japan also, I'm not sure if, if, if they dress in black at, at a funeral or in white. Well, the snail motif uh, seems to seem to interest him, and uh, this is shown also in this work. So we see the old cemetery and the funeral home that he built. Um, Now the Venice Biennial, we are approaching the end of the presentation. Japan, uh, the pa Japan pa Pavilion 2012. Uh, he's actually building uh, some experimental uh, modest houses for so-called common people together with his uh, associates or students, even uh, his uh, employees, his collaborators. And um, they are very uh, unexpected because they are, they have a level of uh, spontaneity and even uh, primitiveness that you wouldn't easily ex you know, expect from an architect of his accomplishments and the sophistication of many of his buildings. This is a model, of course. That was uh, part of the exhibition at the Venice Biennial in 2012, 11 years ago. I think they received the Golden Lion. 
home for all. This was the, the proposal. I mean, the what they exhibited. And these are photographs from the, the building site. And I think that they were built uh, by volunteers, by students, by people in his office and so on. A drawing, uh, you know, but uh, an architecture that is uh, very close to being, uh, you know, uh, almost amateur architecture and, uh, you know, some kind of a, an untrained, uh, you know, vernacular uh, uh, architecture, vernacular architecture, vernacular uh, uh, everything, you know, it's, it's unexpected from a Pritzker Prize laureate, but I'm very happy that, that he engaged in such activities at all, like you know, buildings built by the people for the people with suggestions coming from a very sophisticated and accomplished, uh, uh, you know, uh, architect. And here he is. So I like the fact that an architect of his stature comes down to earth and becomes, uh, you know, a builder uh, of, uh, you know, houses that uh, do not uh, have anything to do with the signature work or the pretensions of, uh, you know, hybrid, uh, uh, you know, uh, status. And yes, he, he, he built maybe even with his own money. You know, building these houses uh, with the help of volunteers, a very nice, uh, worthy activity. And here they are in, 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 in his office, probably. Uh, you see a pot with maybe some, uh, some soup there. And on the right, on the very right, we see Su Fujimoto, who himself is on his way to a stardom, uh, one of his, you know, collaborators. Very nice, you know, it's, it's, it's and, and look, there is, this is not uh, the typical uh, Japanese, uh, you know, uh, interior, you know, highly ordered and, uh, you know, uh, you can see it's a lot of disorder, meaning a lot of life. They are human, just like us, although, you know, you would say the Japanese are from a different world. I like this aspect too. You know, you will not see the, uh, such a pot in, uh, in the office of Sir Norman Foster in no way. Nice, very nice. They deserve the, the Golden Lion. And I hope I have a picture here with them happily receiving the, the high price in, in, in Venice. This was the exhibition. Uh, too bad they cut down too many trees for this exhibition, uh, you know, the Piede stars themselves, not to mention the models and then the, you know, the, the columns. The Venice Biennial, Toyo Ito. And you see the, the exhibition uh, mimics uh, what's ha what was happening uh, on site uh, in Japan. And you know technical drawings for the houses, so they were not as uh, ad hoc as I thought or as they might appear. Uh, here they are, so Fujimoto, the one, the second from the right. Here he is. Hello, Mr. Ito. Uh, he's 20, 82 years old today. Happy birthday to you. I, I think he is in his office here. And here they are, the Venice Biennial, the second on the left, Toyo Ito, the second on the right, so Fujimoto. And unfortunately, I do not know. I think the one in the middle is also a, a, an important architect now in Japan, but uh, Japan, unfortunately, I don't know his name. What is it about these Japanese that they are so formidable in the field of architecture and design? And here they are with a golden lion. 
nice. Let's uh, let's uh, congratulate them because they deserve it. And the houses, I don't know. They are, for my taste, they are a little bit uh, pop and uh, you know sketchy and uh, even uh, postmodern, if I can say so. Excessively whimsical but playful. The university library in Taipei. Now, this is a strange work because the quotation from Frank Lloyd Wright from his um, mushroom columns at the uh, Johnson Wax uh, Center in Wisconsin is so explicit. I'm sure he knows that everybody would know. Uh, maybe it's a way of paying homage to Frank Lloyd Wright, but I'm not sure if Frank Lloyd Wright would have been amused because Something very similar was done by Frank Lloyd Wright uh, at, at Johnson Wax um, Center in Wisconsin. And uh, he's only quoting, but explicitly, this is not uh, plagiarism, it's because everybody knows that work by Frank Lloyd Wright. So when you see this work by Toyo Ito, you wonder, you know. Yet there are differences, but still it, it is clear to me it cannot be otherwise. He was inspired by the work of Frank Lloyd Wright, but like his white shirt with the pink spots that we saw him dressed with at the beginning of the presentation, here also there is a, a, a different kind of aesthetic, architectural aesthetic or aesthetics, but uh, filtered, so to speak, uh, through the great uh, example of, of Wright's work. I, I find it a little bit uh, unconvincing, actually. Um, it's probably a, 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 an homage to write, but and it's it's it belongs to our time, yes, in the sense that it we, we almost make fun of everything, and I'm not sure that this is really needed. It's an interesting work, but uh, it puzzles me a little bit. Its relation with uh, the before mentioned uh, Johnson Wax work by Frank Lloyd Wright. Maybe I, I, I think in too rigid terms, but I imagine that Wright would not have been amused. But who knows? Maybe he had enough humor to be amused. I don't know. But, you know, I was thinking of a possible word instead of aboriginal, unoriginal. And in a certain way, this is an unoriginal work. And I read to my um, um, uh, you know, dismay that uh, Winnie Mass, um, you know, the, uh, the founder of the MVRDV uh, architecture firm in the Netherlands, he said that uh, he actually seemed to promote an unoriginal architecture, meaning an architecture of uh, with a dubious originality. In a certain way, this building probably is. But it is openly so. So I don't know. I, I'm still a little bit unprepared to digest it uh, properly and to formulate, uh, you know, convincing statements about it. It is a quotation, an architectural quotation. This is the work of Frank Lloyd Wright in Wisconsin the United States. And this is the work of Toyo Ito. So it was clearly inspired by, or he was thinking of Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, no doubt. I am closer to accepting and uploading the work of Frank Lloyd Wright, but An interesting attitude, actually, in design. But I know the Japanese, when they, when they, let's say, they even if they copy a woodcut done by a, you know, past master or a previous master, that's not plagiarism. It's a way of honoring a past master by uh, reenactment. And, and and what we see in the work of uh, uh, Toyo Ito here is a reenactment of something that. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright did. 
that's it. So let's wish him happy birthday and uh, thank you for uh, thank you for being here today.